Hello and welcome to our well-advised webinar. Uh, we are so excited to be here today and we have several members from the BAB team here today. My name is Riley Limina and I am a well-being coordinator over here at BAB. Um, we also have Matt Dunlap, who is our Vice President of Well-Advised K and Financial Wellness Expert. Uh, you'll be hearing from him in a bit, a uh, little bit later on here. So thank you again for having us. Um, and this is really meant to be an educational session for you all to learn uh, and to use as a resource whenever you would like. Uh, today we're going to discuss different areas of your well-being and to make sure that, as always, you are well advised. So let's just go ahead and jump right in here. So a little review. Um, let's just start by talking about some of the topics that you have covered in the past uh, in your wellness sessions. So um, stress management, a little bit on nutrition on the go, uh, chronic conditions. New this year, we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness and mental well-being, and of course, financial well-being. Um, just wanted to go over uh, and do a quick little review on e the top three um, topics there and then really delve into the bottom two there. Um, all right, so let's just jump right in. Let's talk a little bit about stress. Um, so it really breaks down into two types of stress. Those are acute and chronic. Um, so let's start a little bit about uh, acute. So this is the stress that you and I experience every day, right? It's from work, maybe your kids, maybe it's your boss. Um, it's the stressors that we really face in everyday life. Uh, maybe it's the demands or pressure from recent past or anticipated of, you know, the near future. Um, an example of this might be speaking in front of a group. Um, anything that really causes your heart rate to go up a little bit um, from a mental perspective. Um, let me just back that up. There's real no extensive damage um, from, from having and experiencing acute stress, right? Um, usually there's, there's treatable... Um, and manageable ways to, to kind of get through this type of stress. Moving to chronic stress. This is really the stress that wears away at you, right? Month after month, year after year. Um, many may not even realize the levels and will ignore it. Uh, this has many negative health impacts and can really affect your physical health uh, in, in the end as well. Um, so difficult to treat and manage, um, and it can require medication and or behavioral management is really the area that we're about to explore. And we'll get into some tips here and talking through those as well. So am I under stress, <laughs> right? Uh, question of the decade here. Um, you know, naturally, at one point or another, we've all experienced uh, probably both of these types of stress, I would imagine. So obviously, stress can present itself in several different ways, um, and we're going to get into that. So obviously, physical symptoms. Um, would present like fatigue, insomnia, or sleep disturbances, stomach aches, indigestion, heartburn, chest pain, muscle pain, um, headaches for sure, weakened immune systems, neck, back pain, things like that. I'm sure we've, we've experienced these shaking, um, teeth grinding is a big one, um, certainly some physical symptoms there. Emotional symptoms. So this would look like, you know, no motivation, irritability or anger, some people might express it as, anxiety, depression, sadness, some restlessness, maybe inability to focus, unstable moods, um, things like that. Leading into behavioral symptoms, um, this would look more like poor eating habits, overeating, undereating, um, either of those, drug and alcohol abuse or use, social withdrawal, so you might start to see somebody, you know, who previously is you know, close to loved ones, friends, um, spouses, even who are kind of withdrawing from those types of people and acting a um, little bit differently. Nail biting, other nervous habits. Um, a lot of people like jiggle their knee, like that's something that's a little <laughs> distracting, um, but certainly some behavioral habits there that we can assess and look into. So how are we supposed to deal with this stress, right? Three ways to really deal with this is number one, we could really change the situation, right? Pull yourself away from the stressful situation, dysfunction, friends, um, you know, maybe it's your job or your living situation. There are certain things that we can control and there are certain things that we cannot control. Um, if you find yourself that you are able to control this in any way, you know, say it's drama with your friends or 
an issue at work that you really can avoid, do so. Number two, you can change the perception of the, stress, the stressful situation. So um, look at the situation as maybe being a challenge, um, a natural part of life, something that's fun, maybe um, a learning experience. And we can probably possibly look at, to, look at this as a, a learning opportunity, right? A growth opportunity. Um, so really being able to change your perception, I think, um, is a good place to start too. Um, you can also change your capacity to deal with the stressful situation. Um, so you can increase your energy uh, and strength levels through eating right, exercising, getting enough sleep and relaxation exercises, really being resilient through these things. Um, you could work on improving those skills that you already have, such as time management, organizational skills, um, and maybe stress management skills to really um, to really curb how we're how we're responding to things that um, aren't necessarily planned for. So this is an interesting one. Obviously, um, when we hear about stress and we talk about stress, the number one way that um, that this is kind of uh, that this is kind of shown in our lives is that we lose our sleep. Right? We're not really getting effective sleep. We're waking up in the middle of the night. We can't get to sleep. We're waking up early. Um, here's some here's some ways that we can really kind of calm down. So naturally, we all know that um, stress can present itself in many different ways. Um, and actually, a study had shown that the most common being sleep deprivation. So let's spend a little time on this. So number one way is we can wake up around the same time every day, right? Um, our body actually really responds well to uh, a routine. So I think being able to wake up um, at the same exact time and kind of get into that routine for your body, your circadian rhythms can kind of catch up and get into a good, good little rhythm for your day um, can really be helpful for your sleep. Being active. I cannot stress this one enough. Exercise obviously tires us all out, right? Our body is equipped with a certain amount of energy every day. Now, everyone's a little different, um, and this also will depend on the foods that we put in our bodies as well. But if you don't use this energy, it basically just gets wasted. So evidence shows that getting over kind of 30 minutes or over of exercise every day will help your sleep cycle. Try to have an early dinner. This includes alcohol, okay? So alcohol actually sends wake signals uh, to wake you up in the middle of the night. So if you're eating any time past eight o'clock, uh, your gut and your, your digestive system are actually still very much working. Um, so this inhibits your ability to get restful sleep too because your body is still using energy um, and keeping itself awake to be able to still do work in, via digestion. So try not to use laptops, phones, tablets. Try to stay away from those things maybe an hour before sleep. Uh, it's actually proven that blue light emitted uh, slows the production of melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. So if you're, you know, again, an hour before bed, you're sitting in your bed and you're just looking through your phone and, you know, I know I, know I do it. I know we all do it. Um, it's, it is going to affect uh, the productivity and the effectiveness of your sleep. So finally, uh, read listen to relaxing music, take a hot shower before going to bed. It's really important to settle in and get your body relaxed before bedtime. So more tips to manage your stress. Like I had said before, be active, right? Go for a walk, take the breaks in the middle of the day to get a stretch in, join an exercise group to really be socially active as well. Um, it's always a really good arena to, to manage your stress. I know I can benefit from it greatly and I do. Give up bad habits, right? Excessive caffeine, alcohol, smoking, and stimulants can lead to increased stress. Play with your pets, like this little cutie right here, right? Natural way to release that stress there. Just makes you happy and um, increases those, those feelings of happiness and can really reduce that, that cortisol, which is the stress horm hormone. Just say no. <laughs> I know this one's tough. You can't just say no always, but of course, when appropriate, right? Um, you know, a lot of times little stressors happen, um, you know, in a work day when sudden things come up that weren't really planned for. Um, if someone asks you to do a favor and it needs to get done quickly, um, 
and you're typically someone to say yes, I mean, never lose sight of being able to ask for more time, right? Ask for a time exten extension um, and really say, you know, I really don't have time to get to this today. Um, I will, uh, but I really just, I really don't have the time today. My schedule is completely pa packed. So you'd be surprised um, how much that will kind of lift off your shoulders and that those last minute little to-dos um, really do kind of kind of weigh in a little bit, right? They feel a little heavy at some time. So when appropriate, just be able to say, not yet, maybe later, I'll get to it tonight, something like that. Create plans and schedules. This is so, so important. I can't stress this enough. Set priorities and set goals for each week, right? Write things down. It's super important if you have a bunch of stuff that's floating around in your head to get it down on paper. It is psychologically proven that when you get things down and out of your mind and on a piece of paper, that they take up less space in your brain and in your conscious thoughts. When you are able to kind of cross things off your list, there's, there's a, a feeling of happiness, right? Weights lifted off your shoulders. You feel a little bit happier when, you, when you're able to really cross things off a to-do list. So give it a try. Break tasks down into smaller steps. Um, right, you know, the best way to eat elephant is is one bite at a time. I don't know who's eating elephants out there, but that's just a saying I heard earlier today. Um, but really break it down into smaller steps. If you have a big task, big project in front of you, it's really important to really take it step by step. Don't get too overwhelmed um, and create a little schedule for yourself. A couple more tips on stress. Let's see here. We want to prepare the night before, right? Um, this is something that's really, really important um, just to be able to kind of have have everything all set before you're getting ready for work in the morning um, so you don't have to really worry about um, maybe getting gas, maybe, um, I don't know, if you have to take the garbage out Tuesday mornings, I'll do that Monday night so that it's not something that's taking up space in my my conscious thoughts in the morning. Like I said... Allow time for yourself. If you're someone who's typically sometimes five minutes late, um, really, really put it in your front psyche to, to, to get up a little bit earlier and really start your day soon. Because if you are starting your day off a little bit late, you're a little bit frantic, you're coming into a meeting, uh, that, that takes a big toll um, on your stress. And if you're starting your morning and you're starting your day out with stress, it's really, really tough to come back down from that. So really, really important. Do something that you love, right? Never lose sight of your passions. I think that's something that's really important, um, you know, just to relax and really get back down to something that uh, you that gives you happiness, right? Um, really, really good to increase the the happiness um, juices in your body so that we can reduce that cortisol, which is that stress hormone. Always stop and take a deep breath. We're going to talk a little bit about this later. Um, in our mindfulness session and when we talk a little bit about mental health, um, but it really, really is important. It might be tough if you have a million things on your mind, um, but take in a deep breath, count to 10, really, really try to clear your mind. Um, it really, really does help. It, it serves as a good uh, reset tool for the day. So definitely a good tip there. All right. So as I kind of finish up with our stress and I move into nutrition on the go, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I do realize that this is a recording, but I will supply you with my email and my phone number um, regarding any stress follow-up that um, I can provide for you. So happy to do that. So, okay, nutrition on the go. Basically, nutrition, uh, the definition of nutrition is the science that studies food and how food nourishes our bodies and influences our health. So what does all that mean, right? Eating well contributes to your overall wellness, okay? It helps reduce your risk for chronic disease incredibly. It helps prevent acute sickness, so colds, flus, things like that. Um, if you're fueling your body with healthy, good, nutritious foods, you are at less risk of, of getting these types of things, colds and flus. It helps your body to function at the maximum level as well. Um, that's obviously what we want at the end of the day. So when we're talking about nutrition, we want to focus on variety. 
We want to focus on amount and we want to focus on the actual things we're putting in our mouth, right? So we want to make small changes first and we want to eat the rainbow. I know that that's something that's said and I learned that a lot in my nutrition classes in college, but it really is true. If you think about, um, you know, if you're, if you're eating fast food every day, if you think of really what those colors are, there's lots of browns, lots of yellows, lots of oranges, right? Maybe not the best for our bodies, right? When I say eat the rainbow, I'm thinking, you know, uh, reds, greens, lots of greens, purple, um, you know, veggie colors, okay? Um, so that's where we're going to get a lot of our, our nutrients, um, flavonoids, things of that nature um, that, that really fuel us to be um, operating at our best, at our best. So the importance of eating on the go. So burning more calories uh, when on the go, you need more fuel, right? More likely to overeat um, when you get home if you skip meals. So let me explain this one a little bit. So if you're only eating twice a day, you're way more likely to just pile, pile food into your mouth because you, you've been so hungry all day. The way your metabolism works is that it's like a muscle, right? Your whole digestive tract is like a big muscle. So if you're going out throughout your whole day and you're not exercising this muscle, it kind of gets tired. It, it doesn't want to do anything. It's very lethargic in your, in your gut system. So all of a sudden, when you start to put food in your mouth because you're eating for your, only the second time in the day, um, your stomach muscles and your intestines and everything really isn't ready yet. Okay, so it's not really absorbing as much as it should be. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. Uh, and that's why we kind of um, push the idea of eating, you know, six or seven small meals a day. This way your digestive tract is ready. It's constantly moving. It's constantly ready to go. Um, yeah, I always just think that it's good to think about it kind of like a muscle. So your performance is negatively uh, affected by the lack of food. Um, you know, food is your fuel. So negative symptoms uh, might include headaches, hunger pains, stomach aches, tiredness, listlessness, weakness, fainting. These are types of things that if you haven't eaten in a while, uh, you might start to experience. This will also lead to a weakened immune system. So you're more likely to get sick if you're not eating, eating uh, well. If you're not eating uh, as much as you should during the day, um, your body actually begins to consume itself without food. So it goes into what we call starvation mode. So first it'll eat fat and then it'll eat muscle um, and then it'll eat other really important tissues that are part of your body. So that's kind of that starvation mode. Um, and what happens is you'll actually gain weight more quickly because your body says, okay, what's going on? We're not getting a lot of nutrition. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna slow down our metabolism and that's, what's going to happen is, um, if you're not eating as much as you should, um, you're actually going to gain weight. I know that's a little, little bit of an oxymoron there, but truth. So dehydration, right? Our body is actually made mostly of water. Okay. Fluids have many functions in the body. So actually we recommend that you should be consuming half of your body weight in ounces of water per day. I cannot stress how important drinking water is. It helps with your digestion. It helps you feel fuller quicker. Um, and it just helps with all the other functions of your body. So symptoms of dehydration are incredibly um, common and actually probably more common than you think. There's probably about 45% of you that are listening to this right now that are actually in a form of dehydration. Um, so negative symptoms, you might start to feel our dry mouth, low blood pressure, volume, which is um, actually very dangerous, headaches, cramping, nausea, things of that nature. Um, just stay hydrated. Like I said, the goal is to really consume one half of your body weight in ounces of water per day. So really, really aim for that. Uh, lots of health benefits associated with that. Fast eating does not mean fast food, right? So when we're in grocery stores and supermarkets, um, there's prepared food sections with healthy foods. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what we should really be looking for if we're trying to make sustainable change in our diet every day. 
So then there's fast casual establishments, okay? Things like Panera Bread, Jason's Deli, Chipotle, um, Noodles and Company. These are places that um, really pack their, their foods with lots of lots of flavoring, which I don't know if any of you know, but most of that flavoring is salt or fat. There are ways that we can uh, spice up our food and make our food flavorful without including salt and fat. Obviously, I love myself a good French fry every now and then, good cheeseburger, but of course, everything in moderation. So look for anything baked, broiled, grilled, poached, roasted, steamed, garden fresh. Um, these are the things and the words that you're going to want to we're going to want to look for when you're when you're shopping. So chicken is a great great source. It all depends on how we prepare it. Um, obviously, a baked chicken would be a little bit better than a deep fried and butter chicken, although that is delicious. There are ways that we can um, spice up our food without using all that butter and, and sauce. Really, really watch out for um, the low carb options. I know this doesn't, this isn't really consistent with anything else I've said, but oftentimes, if if there's something you'll you'll see, you know, a cracker or a cookie box that says low carb. Um, Usually that means that they have supplemented those carbs with, again, fat or salt, which is what really entails that flavoring. So it is a little bit tricky when um, it says low carb. Yes, there might be less carbs in it. However, they supplemented that flavor that they took out with the carbs uh, with fat and salt and sugar. So really, really look out when you're looking at nutrition labels for things like that. So best foods to eat. Um, Let's see, nutrient dense foods are best. Um, this is kind of exactly what I was saying earlier about eating the rainbow. Legumes are very, very good for fiber um, and your digestion, beans, lentils, dairy products, yogurts and cheeses, avocados are amazing. Um, really wanna look for those leafy greens, um, spinach, um, lettuce, anything of that nature um, that's really, really good and provides fiber for you. So try to eat whole foods too. Like I said, protein really slows digestion, keeps blood sugar steady, and it helps you feel full longer, kind of how water works. Um, it really just, it takes up more space, right? And your small intestine, your large intestine, your stomach, right? So it helps you feel fuller because you are. Um, just a little piece, side piece on this. Um, when you're eating, we really, really, really wanna make sure that we're eating mindfully. And what I mean by that is we're actually taking our time, we're slowing down, and we're actually tasting all of our food, right? A lot of us who maybe eat once or twice a day, you know, one or two meals a day, we're wolfing our food down so quickly that we don't even give our stomach enough time to realize that it's getting full, right? So when I say mindful eating, it's really, really listening to your body and how your stomach feels. There are times that, I mean, you know, I, I, I can admit to it. I've eaten three pieces of pizza and I'm like, towards the end, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even realize how full I was getting, <laughs> right? So really, really pay attention to how you're feeling. Um, and that way it, you can kind of avoid that weight gain there. Avoid sugary drinks, okay? That includes uh, even orange juice, uh, any Coke, Pepsi products, things like that. Of course, those things are delicious. And like I said, everything is okay in moderation. Um, energy drinks can provide a, an extremely dangerous aspect to your health. Um, what happens is it increases your heart rate so quickly and it changes a lot and puts a lot of stress on your body and your internal functions. So um, please stay away um, to the best of your ability. Um, really, if, if you love drinking um, energy drinks, please just limit it to one a day. Some simple snack ideas. Uh, peanut butter and apple slices is always a good go-to. Um, again, that's a lot of fiber being offered to you in that, so um, helping us feel full a little bit longer. And it's energy, um, energy rich and nutritious rich foods. Okay, ants on a log, that's always a good one. Love that. Reminds me of my childhood. Celery and peanut butter. Um, put some raisins on there again. Good for fiber. Carrots and hummus is always a great one. Um, non-fat Greek uh, yogurt, almonds, granola, any other fruits, things you could put in there. Nuts are actually very, very good for your health. Um, they provide good fats. There are such things as good fats, I promise. Um, 
when you get into the omega threes and the omega sixes that there are good fats out there and those are provided in cashews, almonds, uh, pistachios, things of that nature. So really good stuff. A few others. So tips for taking food with you. Have travel food containers, right? It's always good to, to plan ahead and to be able to bring these things with you uh, maybe the night before you're going to work the next day. This way you're prepared um, and whatever you give yourself access to is what you're going to eat. I'll say that again. Whatever you give yourself access to is what you're going to eat. So on a personal note, my favorite food in the whole entire world is Cool Ranch Doritos. So I, and I found a week where I was just like eating them every night and that's so not good, right? So all of a sudden I stopped buying Doritos <laughs> and so therefore I stopped eating them, right? So if you really wanna make a behavior change, um, you know, do your best to maybe eliminate those things from your house, that way you won't eat them. Plan ahead, like I said, right? Have a prep day, Sunday or maybe a day off, cook food in larger quantities and maybe save it or freeze it. That way when you come home, you know, seven, eight, nine, nine o'clock from work, you're not just grabbing the first thing you see in the pantry. You're not grabbing the first thing, you know, heating up a frozen pizza. You have something that you had prepared previously that has health benefits and that's healthy um, for you to eat. And it's, it's quickly um, attainable if you freeze it. So that's always a good one. Make snack baggies. Um, to portion out items ahead of time so that, you know, you're not sitting in front of the television with your Cool Ranch Doritos and all of a sudden uh, the whole entire bag is gone, right? <laughs> so it's always good if you, you know, put your snacks in a bowl, in a baggie, something that um, really just stops you when you're done. That's always a good, um, a good thing to explore too. Another portion of that mindful eating there too. So make a smoothie. It's awesome, right? We've had some really good weather um, so far up here in Pittsburgh, at least. I don't know how it is in other parts of the world, but been really, really warm and hot out. So smoothie is definitely something that um, has many health benefits uh, and is also very refreshing. So use fruits, use vegetables, yogurts, peanut butter, right? I know vegetables sounds crazy in, in a uh, smoothie. Um, however, it you should try it. I really do recommend it. Um, Honestly, you might not even be able to taste it, but there are health benefits that are in there and that you're getting into your body that are gonna be helpful for you. All right, let's move into chronic disease. Um, so really, let's start by defining what is chronic disease and disability. So what is chronic disease? This is really any illness, impairment, or condition that's lasting longer than three months, okay? It may be very limiting to your daily activities. So let me rewind here. Uh, less than, it has to be lasting longer than three months, okay? So this isn't if you broke your arm, if you, you know, are a little sore from a workout, that doesn't count as chronic disease. Um, we're gonna define this a little bit further on um, and kind of talk a little bit more about this and how we can really reduce our risk of developing a chronic illness and an impairment. So like I said, this may be limiting in daily activities. It may require ongoing medical care and medical expenses. Some key behavioral risk factors are lack of physical activity is number one. Poor diet and nutrition is number two. And actually a study showed that 90% uh, of folks who have a chronic disease or a chronic condition consume too much sodium, uh, which leads to high blood pressure. And we're gonna talk about why that's a major risk factor here in a second. Tobacco use, alcohol consumption, stress, lack of relationships are all things that are proven to in increase your risk uh, significantly of developing a chronic disease. We're gonna talk about that in a second. So here's what we call a chronic illness cycle. So obviously you have chronic condition at the top um, and it's, we're gonna kind of go through this web. Um, chronic condition, that will lead to tense muscles, right? Um, you know, you have hypertension, you have heart disease, you have diabetes, your body isn't functioning. Um, at, the, at the highest degree in which it should be, okay? That could potentially lead to pain, right? You're going throughout your day, you're not being physically productive, you're not being mentally productive because you're experiencing pain. No one likes to feel that, right? Pain could absolutely affect your sleep cycles. Um, you're going to sleep, you have severe back pain, um, 
obviously that might affect your sleep in some degree. Anxiety and difficult emotions from poor sleep. You're waking up, you're not getting your full restful sleep, you're not setting in your REM stage five of sleep. Um, and therefore you might wake up a little cranky, a little anxious, um, and you might not have released 100% uh, of that, that stress cortisol um, hormone when you're, when you're asleep. So definitely could lead to anxiety and difficult emotions to deal with there. Anxiety, of course, has a high comorbid rate with depression. Um, and then naturally depression, uh, one of the main symptoms of depression and factors of depression is fatigue. Um, and then we kind of start this whole little cycle and it's kind of like what came first, chicken or the egg kind of thing. Um, but definitely want to avoid to our best, to the best of our ability, um, developing a chronic disease because again, um, it can just kind of lead into chronic condition after chronic condition. And um, then you're kind of, you're spinning on a wheel of not good. So you're kind of going down a, a tough path. So if we work to reduce that risk, We'll be heading down the right path. So top 10 chronic conditions, let's run through them. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Alzheimer's and dementia, depression, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, diabetes is number five, coronary heart disease, arthritis, high cholesterol. Number one is high blood pressure, hypertension. We are always shooting for the 120 over 80 number, um, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit too. Um, but absolutely, most of these are able to be curbed and cured through behavior, and if not medication. Um, obviously, when I aim for changing that behavior, changing our eating habits, increasing our exercise habits every day um, in order to avoid developing one of these. Um, naturally, uh, her heredit, you know, if it's in your if it's in your genes, hereditarily, Sure, you could absolutely have one of these and 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 be the healthiest person in the world. You could work so hard to get your hypertension down through your eating habits, your exercise habits, and you still could hereditarily develop hypertension. And that's understandable. Those are the types and kinds of things that we can't control. So that that would be a case where we would probably apply some medication to uh, heavily more affect that condition. So let's talk a little bit about diabetes. Let's know the symptoms. Okay. Blurry vision, number one, always tired, always thirsty, sudden weight loss. Actually, that's a common misconception. Everyone thinks that if you have diabetes, um, you're going to be a little bit overweight. Actually, what happens is you're, you're going to experience sudden weight loss in some cases. Frequent urination because you're so thirsty, wounds that won't heal, um, numb or tingling hands or feet, always hungry. Um, you're always tired, you're always hungry, you're always thirsty. Blurry vision is one because um, actually what happens when you have diabetes is your, your capillaries in your eyes um, actually, they're constricted, right? So it's lacking blood flow uh, to your eyeballs. So it's really, really going to inhibit your ability to be able to see clearly. Um, you're always tired because your body is not using its glucose correctly. Um, there's, there's an issue with, um, your internal workings there. Um, but just, just a few things that, um, you know, would be associated with diabetes and really knowing those symptoms there. Wounds that won't heal. Um, it's probably because your it really heavily affects your neurons and your neurological system. So, uh, you can't really feel much. Um, your nerve endings are kind of damaged. They're not really working as well as they should be. So it's really extremely dangerous. Um, heard a story about a man who uh, worked on a construction site. He did not know he had diabetes and he came home, took his boot off and his boot was full of blood. Um, he did not know that he had stepped on a nail because he couldn't feel it. Um, so there was some serious, uh, there were some serious issues related uh, with that. He's okay now, but um, certainly some, some risks associated with that and not being able to fill wounds. So enough of that. How do we prevent chronic condition, right? Let's start today um, to really, really reduce this risk. Modify your lifestyle behaviors. We talked a little bit about this. We can control and cure most of these just by eating right and exercising regularly. Going back to the nutrition uh, presentation, lots of good tips 
um, and certainly health benefits towards kind of changing your behaviors there. Everything in moderation, right? Avoid tobacco use. That's huge. Tobacco use is going to put you at risk for heart disease, hypertension, uh, and cancer. So certainly want to avoid that. Avoid excessive consumption of alcohol, right, in moderation, okay? You know, maybe not have eight beers a night. Um, I believe the CDC recommends uh, no more than one beer, uh, one, one drink a night uh, for women and two for men. So that is um, what they recommend, no more than. That's kind of what the definition of the excessive piece is. Maintain a healthy weight, right? Um, more importantly, a, a BMI. So if you can go on and calculate your BMI, that's really, really what we're looking at um, to maintain. Get enough sleep. I cannot stress this enough. Rest and sleep is huge um, and hugely important to our overall health. You saw that cycle earlier and how if we're not getting enough sleep, it can cause some serious anxiety. Focus on your overall well-being, okay? Listen to your doctor and manage your cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar levels, things like this. And lastly, of course, manage that stress. We heard a lot about stress earlier today, um, and it certainly affects the way we live our lives uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So huge, hugely important to manage our stress. So stress in your body. Chronic stress can have a variety of harmful effects on your body, believe it or not. So stress could equal tight muscles, could equal headaches, uh, back pain, shoulder pain, body aches, things like that. And then we start that cycle of that chronic illness. Um, it could also really compromise our immune system, right? More susceptible to things like cold or flu, and it takes longer to recover once we have those things. All right, it could also increase our volume and blood pressure, um, increase blood glucose and risk for diabetes as well. Um, so here's what happens when you have high blood pressure, folks. So um, basically, you have your top number and your bottom number. 120 over 80 are the numbers that we want to shoot for. The top number is basically the pressure in your heart and in your veins when, you're, when your heart is constricted, right, when it's beating. So that's when the heart pumps. It's shooting blood all throughout your body, okay? The bottom number, 80, is when your heart is at rest. So the pressure in your heart and in your veins when your heart is at rest. So that is when it is in between pumps, it's released its beat, and it's now sucking all the blood back to the heart again. Okay, so that's that's the number that we really, really wanna shoot for in terms of pressure. If it's lower than that, even better. And the only way we can really affect that behavior-wise is by exercising daily, uh, you know, 30 minutes a day, and also getting those veggies in and drinking tons of water. So um, that is chronic disease. Um, again, we can refer back to our nutrition, our exercise uh, PowerPoints to really, really help us reduce that risk of developing a chronic disease because it is a cycle, guys. Um, you know, once you get one, it, it, there's high comorbidities to others, and we certainly do not want that. All right, let's talk a little bit about mindfulness. So a mindfulness practice is the active process of bringing your attention to the present moment. Okay, we do this through bringing our attention to our thoughts, awareness to our feelings and emotional responses, by noticing our surroundings and by checking in with our body, our body sensations. So the key to doing this successfully is without judgment and through skill and really being intentional with it. So mindfulness practices really include the following elements. Awareness, okay? Being tuned in with what is happening in the present moment, including sights, sounds, smells, physical sensations you might be actually feeling that you otherwise would have ignored. Focus, paying attention to the present moment without thinking about past or future events. Acceptance, okay? So accepting whatever you might be feeling or thinking without um, judging uh, or trying to change your, your general reactions to that. And then of course, observation. So recognizing unpleasant sensations, thoughts, and feelings as temporary uh, and fleeting as they may be, the key to this is really observing them more objectively without reaction or judgment. So what are some benefits to mindfulness? Uh, there's a ton of health benefits associated with mindfulness. So improved quality of life, decreased stress and anxiety, 
lowered heart rate, decreased burnout. So we're really seeing some, some physical benefits to this uh, as well. So expanded self-control, really, really being aware of what your body is feeling um, and, and being able to kind of respond to that effectively. Improved memory, increased resiliency, especially during this time is extremely crucial to our mental health and well-being. Improved social relationships, okay? So huge health benefits to this, um, this thing we call mindfulness, and we're gonna get into that um, here shortly. So a few of the most common mindfulness exercises uh, are mindful breathing. Um, so this is one of the simplest exercises and mindful uh, is, is it's mindful breathing, right? And in mindfulness in general. Simply spend a few minutes focusing on your awareness um, and on the movement of your thoughts and your breath in and out without trying to change them in any way. Second one is a body scan, okay? This sounds crazy, but so while seating, while seated or lying down um, and in your, your mostly, your most relaxed state, gradually focus your attention on one body part at a time, noticing any physical sensations without really judging or reacting to them. A typical body scan might start uh, with the soles of your feet and then progressively move you know, towards, towards your knees, your hips, your back, belly, chest, um, and then finally your neck and your head. So ways mindfulness really, really reduces stress. Um, you're more aware and sensitive to the needs of your body. Um, you're, you may notice kind of pains earlier um, and then can take, can take appropriate action to those. Um, you're more aware of the emotions of others around you, okay? As your emotional intelligent, intelligence rises, you're less likely to get into conflict with others. Oops, sorry about that. Let me back up. Um, your level of care and compassion for yourself and others rises, okay? Uh, your empathy and your willingness to learn about somebody else um, should increase as well, and your ability to do that should get better. So this compassionate mind kind of soothes you and inhibits your stress response for you and for others. So continued, mindfulness practice, uh, uh, practices really reduce activity in the part of your brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is central to switching on your stress response, so effectively uh, your background level of stress is actually reduced. You're better able to focus, okay? So you compete, you complete your work more efficiently, um, you're more effective, you're highly productive, you have a greater sense of well-being, and this reduces your stress response. So actually right now I'm gonna take you through um, a mindfulness exercise called finding your breath. So if you're not already sitting, I would recommend that you do so now and really, really get comfortable. Okay, here we go. So close your eyes or let them soften. Let your eyelids be heavy. Allow yourself to settle into a comfortable seat with your hands in your lap. Find a nice long spine. Feel the chair supporting your weight as you begin to notice your breath. Notice it enter and leave your body, in through your nose and out through your nose or your mouth. Perhaps you find the point of contact where your sense of breath and mostly entering your nose, the back of your throat, to the rise and fall of your chest or belly. Don't try to change anything about your breath, just pay attention to it. Naturally, thoughts will arise, uh, which is so normal, without judgment. Just name for yourself, um, I'm having a thought, and then return to your breath. You may do this hundreds of times throughout the exercise. That's why they call it practice, right? Let your breath be your anchor, bringing you back to the present, in and out, moment again and again, in and out. In and out. You may notice a pain in your body. Return to your breath. You notice you feel too hot or too cold. Return to your breath. You notice an itch that you may want to scratch. 
Return to your breath. Slowly try to turn your attention back to your breath, over and over, again and again. Begin to wiggle your, finger, your fingers and toes, and then return your gaze back to this space. Okay. So that was just a, a brief preview, and I appreciate you taking that with me, um, of really what a mindfulness uh, meditation session really could look like. Um, it, should, it should be a little bit longer than that, but for the sake of the presentation, um, I just wanted to keep it concise for everybody today. But um, really a, a really good opportunity to kind of step away from the work day um, or weekend day, whatever it may be, to really, really take a moment to really breathe and relax and bring it back to you. Um, you know, your most, your most important asset is your health, um, and no one's going to fight for that more than you could. So uh, really, really important as we kind of grow through this mental resiliency phase in our lives here. So here are some mindfulness apps uh, that are really cool. They kind of take you right through similar to what I just did. Um, a lot of them are just sounds um, of nature, of waves, of birds chirping, things like that. A lot of them are actual um, people taking you through these mindfulness meditation sessions, and a lot of them are both. So I encourage you to um, check these out. You know, if you're interested, I'm always available as well. Um, but these are some really, really cool ones. So depression and anxiety disorders. I want to talk a little bit about this today without um, being too heavy on you guys, um, but truly, um, really really important stuff the mental health uh aspect that we're that we're really experiencing today so mental illness um a mental illness is a medical condition that affects a person's thinking feeling or mood uh, it can disrupt someone's ability to relate to others and function on a daily basis and of course uh, mental illness does not discriminate it affects people of all ages races, religion, um, and income. Of course, different treatments work for different indiv individuals. A lot of times folks are on medication and that works for them. A lot of times, you know, there's behavioral changes and stress mechanisms and management mechanisms that people can use uh, more behaviorally that work for them as well. Some people use both. So depression and anxiety disorders. Depression and anxiety disorders are, are not the same, but actually people with depression often experience nervousness, irritability, and problems sleeping and concentrating and other symptoms that are actually similar to anxiety disorders. So there's a high comorbidity rate um, between anxiety disorders and depression. It's not uncommon, like I said, for someone with an anxiety disorder to suffer from depression and vice versa. So nearly 50% of those diagnosed with depression are also diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. So this gives you a little bit of a, um, a snapshot of how common having both of these disorders is. So we're just going to kind of dive into a few of the types of anxiety, types of depression disorders that someone could have. So first one being generalized anxiety disorder. According to the Anxiety Depression um, Association of America, generalized anxiety disorder is characterized by persistent and excessive worry about everything that spans from money, health, uh, family, work, and other issues. So people with generalized anxiety disorder are usually always anticipating disaster uh, or expecting the worst, even when there's real, really no evidence that they should be concerned. So depressive disorders. Depressive disorders, also known as mood disorders, they really include three types. Major depression, persistent depressive disorder, and, and bipolar disorder. So we're moving from this anxiety uh, disorder to depressive disorders. So major depression involves at least five of the symptoms listed below for a two-week period. So that's a lot of symptoms. Um, but we're not talking about, you know, 
the one day that you're feeling a little bit down um, or, you know, something happened and you're feeling a little bit stressed or, or nervous or tired or fatigued. This is, uh, this is a little bit more than that, um, where you're involved with at least five of these symptoms uh, that are listed below for a two week or more period. Okay, so that's every day for two weeks. Um, some of those things include persistent sad mood most of the day, you're feeling fatigued, you're really not interested in things that you used to be interested in, okay, feelings of guilt that are unnecessary, worthlessness, um, helplessness, feelings that you're kind of bringing somebody else down um, are really the things that we're, that we're going to be feeling uh, for more than a two-week period. That, that's major depression right there. So persistent depressive disorder, or PDD, is a form of depression that usually continues uh, for at least two years. So this is obviously a little bit more extensive than the major depression, although it is less severe than it, uh, it involves the same symptoms. Um, the symptoms feel a little less severe, but they just, they last longer. So again, sad mood combined with low energy, poor appetite, overeating or undereating, um, insomnia or trouble sleeping, oversleeping, um, and naturally the stress, irritability, um, and the, really the inability to derive pleasure from, from most activities. So we're going to talk a little bit about bipolar disorder um, and kind of what that entails. So this is characterized by moods that shift from severe highs, um, which is also known as mania, to severe lows, which is known as depression. So the mood episodes associated with the, this disorder persist from days to weeks um, or longer, and they may be dramatic. So during that depressive phase, some things that you'll see, kind of like we already kind of discussed, you know, feelings of hopelessness, pessimism, difficulty concentrating, really somebody who has no energy, they're very slowed down, um, you know, changes in appetite, suicide attempts, thoughts of death and suicide, things like that. Something you might see in the same person, um, you know, within minutes, you might start to see a manic phase. This could look like um, abnormal or, ex or excessive elation, um, random laughter that is inappropriate, um, irritability or a decreased need for sleep, grandiose notions. So that could be me um, maybe thinking that I'm, um, you know, better or the best at something that I'm, I'm really not um, actually very skilled at at all. Um, and that having that delusion and that uh, hallucination there. High distractibility, increased talkativeness, nervousness, um, th things of that nature. So this is something that you could see in the, in the same person, like I said, experiencing a very depressive phase, and then you know within seconds, kind of going and turning over to this manic phase, which is this high energy, um, you know, high energy kind of experience. Okay, let's talk a little bit about stigma. Um, so what is it? Stigma is a mark of disgrace really associated with a particular circumstance, uh, quality, or person. So what are some things people might say about those who have mental, mental illness? Um, you know, full, full uh, disclosure here, no judgment. Uh, there are words that people use um, that aren't, aren't kind, right? You know, we use the word crazy, we use the word psycho, we use the word delusional or, you know, um, whatever those words may be. Um, it's really, really important to recognize that although, you know, these are words that are in our day-to-day -day narrative that this could really be affecting somebody. It's really important that we are intentional with our words. Okay, self-stigmatization makes patients or people harm, uh, shameful um, and secretive, and that could prevent them from actually accessing that care. So many times depressive moods are hidden and we cannot tell who's struggling. This may deter someone um, from really, really getting treatment. Um, so not only is there stigmatization that's going out in the world, it's going on out in the world, but it's actually happening internally as well. If I'm somebody who's feeling depressed or like I have, like I'm struggling from, um, you know, a mental disorder, 
I'm thinking that, okay, people are going to think that I'm crazy. I'm, I'm not going to go get help, right? Um, that kind of thing, which is not something that you should do. You should always, always, always get help and take everybody seriously who says that they need help. So talk about it, right? Recognize that although you may feel uncomfortable, um, you're sharing a legitimate medical concern in order to get help, the help that you need, right? So when you're trying to get care, you're trying to get access to care, choose which physician uh, you really want to confide in, okay? Do some research and see, um, you know, who you would be interested in talking to about this, about some, you know, some issues that you may be having. When you get in there, set goals for that conversation, okay? Remember that diagnosing and treating depression takes time and expertise. So if your goal is to make your symptoms disappear immediately, uh, you're likely going to be disappointed. It is a process, right? Um, you know, whether it's medication, whether it's changing some things behaviorally, um, it's certainly going to be a process. So be patient with yourself. Set a few reasonable goals for the conversation uh, with your doctor, such as putting your concerns on the table and really working with your doctor and be truthful um, and really determine a plan to address those concerns. State your concerns as plainly as you can, right? Don't try to beat around the bush. Um, really be open and honest. The doctor is here to help you um, and is, is open to hearing everything that you have to say. Lastly, I know I said it, but truly be patient, be kind to yourself. Um, you know, finding the right solution can take time and that's really, really important. So that's what I have on mental health today. Um, thank you, I really, really appreciate you joining me. Um, and I'm here as a resource. Again, my name is Riley Limina with BAB Well Advised. With that, I would like to introduce to you our Assistant Vice President of Well Advised. He is our financial wellness expert and has a lot to share with you today. Matt? Thank you, Riley. My name is Matt Dunlap, and I am the AVP of Well Advised, specifically financial well-being. Today's well-being topic is going to be about budgeting. There's seven simple, basic, yet extremely effective steps that we're going to follow to either create a budget or enhance and improve your budget. You might be doing some of these steps already and you don't even know it, uh, but the, we're going to go through these to help you build or to adjust your budget properly. First, we want to determine our values. Spending habits often are directly correlated with the values of an individual or a family. So what different activities are you doing? Your lifestyle, uh, education, and religion are all different examples of ways that we're spending time and spending money and our budget should be directly correlated or built based off our values and our goals, which is our second step. Uh, determine and set your goals. Goals are a big deal when we're starting something new, anything in life, especially around financial or healthy habits. We want to split our goals into three separate sections, short, medium, and long-term goals. You can see how long uh, of goals we want to set for each, six less than six months, six to 24, and two to five years. So it's a really important that when we set our goals, we're setting specific goals, we're setting goals with time measurements in place, and we're setting realistic goals. We don't want to set goals that are too easy to achieve or too hard to achieve, and that's not that's not practical and that's uh, not helpful. So we want to create goals that are realistic in a time manner and ones that were going to help us get to where we want to go and then breaking them into short, medium, and long-term goals. Step three is we want to determine our income, specifically net income. So our gross income is how much we actually get paid by an employer. And then we have deductions for healthcare, 401k, other benefits, things like that. And that gives us to our total taxable income. And from our total taxable income, obviously, we have to take taxes away from that and we get to our net income. Our net income is going to be the top line of our budget or how much is going into our budget. And then our expenses are going to pull from that net income. Step four, we want to identify high priority bills, mortgage, rent, basic utilities, auto, personal insurance, health insurance. These are all what we would consider high priority bills. Uh, Netflix, unfortunately, even though very important, uh, especially nowadays, uh, is not a high priority bill. 
the most important part about step four that we want to remember is we want to standardize our bill payments. We always want to compare income and expenses on an equal basis, but making sure that all of our expenses are also standardized as well. Some things like insurance might be deducted per pay when rent is monthly. We want to make sure it's on a standardized basis in calculating that uh, in equivalently. When we identify our high priority bills, this is a nice little worksheet that we use uh, to help calculate not only the priority list, but how much per month we're spending on certain items. Uh, things like mortgage or rent is a pretty standard payment uh, where things like groceries are variable based on each month or how much we're eating and spending uh, at home. So with that being said, prioritize them and expenses that we are building might change and that's okay. Uh, this is budgeting is always a working document and we're going to be enhancing and improving it constantly. So it's okay if it's a little bit off to start, but we want to hone in on what that specific dollar amount is as we get better with our budgets month over month. The categories can change based on your personal situation, uh, but this is a nice little starter guide. So talking about expense allocation and, and how much we should be spending in each category is something that if you've never budgeted before could seem daunting or difficult. Uh, this is a helpful recommendation. This isn't going to work for everybody, but this is a percentage recommendation of where our net income should be spent via expenses. So we want to spend 10% of our expenses on savings, 15% on debt. 15 on transportation. Obviously, that could be changed pretty severely right now if we're uh, if we're being socially distant and not traveling to work or, or going out. Um, living expenses should be 25 and housing should be 35. The reason I started with savings and debt is solely because sometimes savings and debt gets put on the back burner of things that we want to spend money on towards savings or paying off credit cards. Uh, but it's important that we build that savings account and also pay off that debt as if we don't, uh, it can be more costly with an interest long term. So we want to make sure we're paying down our debt and we want to make sure we're creating a savings to help protect for the future. Once we do those two things, uh, all the other things will fall into place. We want to make sure that we're doing all of them in some capacity. Step five for building a successful budget, uh, create a savings plan. Like we said, savings is important and wants to be about 10% of our net income. Uh, but even getting further and more specific, the three major savings accounts that we want to build is an emergency account, a retirement account, and then a normal savings for purchases. An emergency account should be three to six months uh, of expenses when fully built out. Now, I know that's going to take some time to get to if you've never built an emergency savings account, but it's important that you build a safety net in case a flat tire or a water heater goes uh, we have money built for that so we don't have to take out short-term loans or take money out of retirement uh, in order to pay that. So let's start building an emergency savings account if you haven't already. And if you are, great. Uh, let's continue to grow it. The second is a retirement account. Obviously, it's important to plan for retirement, whether you are saving for retirement via a savings account or via an investment account. Uh, we want to be preparing for the future. That's probably one of your long-term goals, two to five or even more years out. Uh, but always having a plan for retirement is good. And finally, purchases and saving for other events for our entertainment expenses and things like that. Uh, that's what that third savings account is. But we want to create a plan. That's that's the big that's the big part of number five. Six tracking expenses. So as we've created the budget at the beginning of the month, we've built it out. Now as the month goes on, we're going to start spending uh, maybe maybe some items that we estimated are we spend less or some we spend more. Um, but we want to track how we're actually spending so that we can get a better idea for next month of how to budget better. Uh, it, need, it needs to work for you. So determine what works best, how you're going to track them, whether it's uh, on paper, spreadsheets, applica applications, or technology. There's plenty of them out there, plenty of resources uh, that you can reach out to us and we can help provide. But we want to track our expenses to make sure that we are on track with our budget. And finally, modify as necessary. 
So you don't have to be perfect the first time. Nobody's expecting your budget to be exactly the same as what your end, your end month spending is. Uh, but we want to get closer to that goal on a month by month basis. So adjust your budget as need be based on month of the year, holiday season, uh, or just based off the spending uh, that you currently have. If you find that you're spending more than you're making or your budget is out of, out, uh, out of line in regards to that, uh, here are some cost-cutting tips to help. We want to maybe limit, limit our entertainment expenses or dining out. Dining out can, uh, can add up quickly if we're doing it on a consistent basis from a cost perspective. The second is cable and streaming services. Nowadays, we have all of the different streaming services that we watch our favorite shows on, which is great. Uh, but if we're not using all of them, uh, maybe cutting some of them or overpaying for some of these services uh, can help with expenses. We have a great article and a, a worksheet to help with that at welladvisedk.com backslash COVID-19 survival toolkit. Uh, the hyperlink's at the bottom. But you can see a great step-by-step -step tutorial on how to basically cut the cord and stop overpaying for TV. The other two strategies is our 30-day buying strategy. This is if you see something you want to buy, uh, take 30 days, think about it. And on the 30th day, if this is still something you want to buy, uh, then then go for it if it's something you really need. If after 30 days you, you decide that it's not important anymore, uh, maybe maybe we can spend that money on something else. Obviously, this doesn't work for all things because based on urgency, uh, there's there's thing there's times where we just need to purchase things and we can't wait 30 days. But this is more for the leisure spending uh, for the wants versus the needs, if that makes sense. And finally, celebrations and holidays, gifting can be ex as as great as it is, uh, can sometimes be extremely costly. Uh, so maybe thinking about creative ways to either make something or uh, to design something instead of buying something is a good way to help cut on cost. Th I want to thank everybody for participating in our financial portion of today's uh, well-being se session, and I'm going to turn it back over to Riley. Thank you, Matt. Um, we just want to thank everybody for coming out today and listening to what we have to say. Um, that was a lot of information. Again, if you have questions, um, they are provided for you on the resource page. Um, thank you very much.